Good evening, everybody. It is wonderful to see you all. We are in the world of Kongans and Huadu, as you heard during the introduction this afternoon. If you have any questions regarding Zen meditation or Huadu, the great question, or Kongans, these cases, feel free to ask. Is there a way to, how say, to ease the pain on the legs? on the meditation because for me it's very hard to stay in that position and yeah, of course you can do three important things one is do some exercise so not just sit in meditation monks in Korea they go mountain climbing that lots I of walking very often. some of them do yoga okay. so number one is exercise Number two is drink enough. If you don't drink enough, then during meditation, your, all your joints may become stiff and tight. And the third is stretch. So you need to really stretch the legs, the back, various parts of the body. So exercise, stretch, and drink. Drink water or tea, okay? <laughs> And most of that pain actually is from your karma. Very little is from the body. So as you practice more and your karma passes, 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 there's less and less pain in the body. It's okay, to, for example, to restrict the blood, blood flow in the legs. I can, for example, manage the pain, but it is okay to do this in the meditation. Should I stop then or continue and uh, just accept the pain? If you feel pain and the stop of blood flow, then relieve the position. Okay. Okay. There are ways to do that. And some schools allow that, like ours does. But some other traditions don't allow that. Then you have to prepare better. Okay. Okay. Yeah. More questions? Uh, regarding the uh, Huadu, uh, can you tell us, please, how does Huadu help us solve the Konga? Sure. Huadu is the great question. You've heard about that. So, original Huadu is, what is this? What is it that sees with my eyes, hears with my ears, feels with the heart, thinks with the mind? So, that's original Huadu. So, then this question appears in the six patriarchs' life first then it becomes part of our practice. So originally, this was part of a much bigger story. So in Korean, Yukcho Desa, in English, the sixth patriarch, Huineng, he got transmission from the fifth patriarch in a way that some other monks didn't like it. So he had to escape. And there was a professional monk who was a soldier before. That professional soldier hunted down the sixth patriarch, in order to obtain the Buddha's bowl and kasa, which was the symbol of Dharma transmission. So the sixth patriarch actually stopped and waited. He knew he couldn't escape. And then he asked the pursuer, when you don't think of good and bad, what is your original face? So that's the origin of this wadu. Korean Buddhism originated from China much earlier than Japanese Buddhism. And this sixth patriarch question went straight into Korea and stayed in the mountains to the present day. So there are many treasures in Korean Buddhism. One is that this question remained the same, unaltered, unchanged. So if you ask Korean monks, they all know this. So this Wadu is our treasure. Because it gives you don't know. When you don't think of good and bad, what is your original face? So what is this? Then this don't know mind appears, becomes bigger, bigger, bigger. So when it becomes big enough, reaches critical threshold, then, as you already know, you pass through the gate of no thinking. You transcend language. And when you do that, your mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. Little bit like uranium, become dense and dense and dense and dense. Then 
it can turn into two things, nuclear power plant or a nuclear bomb. But the reaction is the same. So many people have clear mind, but very few have actual bodhisattva direction. Very few use that for all beings. Some people use it for themselves. They're very clear. Still, there is I. Okay? So, cognition and emotion, they are part of our lives. Without that, we would not be human. But if you identify with cognition and emotion, you are just a sentient being. That's all. From time immemorial, human beings wanted to transcend cognition and emotion. Some of us succeeded, some of us did not. But if you did, there were several side effects. One is intuition. So when you attain your true nature, your intuition kicks in, starts to work. It's non-dualistic wisdom, one of its functions. Selfless compassion, another function. Spontaneous reaction with very clear background, also another function. If you use the Huadu correctly, you solve the Kongans, many Kongans. You already know. Somebody asked Zen Master Giorgio, why did Bodhidharma come to China? That is, what is the meaning of Zen? He says, cypress tree in the front garden. Just poof, reflect. Imagine he's sitting in his room, beautiful room. Must be very nice, tea table. All Korean Zen Masters, wonderful tea sets. Great tea table. Look sad, it's cypress tree in the front garden. Beautiful reflection. So you contemplate that, you become one with that, your thinking goes away. Your dualistic mind goes away. You become one. So that oneness experience is when the mind changes, attains something higher than the self, and then our patterns become different. You have thoughts, but you don't have the thinker anymore. Very different. Okay? You use your thoughts, but your thoughts don't use you anymore. You live in this world, but you're not afraid of death anymore. Things like that. I would like to know, um, what would you recommend to a beginning meditator in terms of noise level? How silent should be the environment be for the first attempts, first sessions? It really depends on your sensitivity, okay? So don't make it too noisy just because you want to train hard. But eventually, a good meditator should endure any kind of noise level. So this oneness experience that Zen is really about means that you do not put a barrier between you and the environment. So if you meditate correctly, and let's say you wait for a train at a train station, and suddenly an engine comes and boop, okay? Many people are shocked or frightened because they are just halfway there or 30% in the body. The rest is missing. They're thinking, they're dreaming, they're somewhere else. If you're 100% present, then this thing doesn't shock you. So that's number one noise and spontaneity training together, okay? But beginning time, we want things to be really quiet. Why? So that you could focus inside and not worry about the environment. We want people to breathe very quietly walk very quietly. It's also mindfulness training, but it's beginning to perceive the mind. That's why we do it, so that you could really focus on what's going on and be here with your clarity. Now, if we start to distract people too soon, then this focus cannot become stronger. It's like with the Kongans. If I give you something too difficult, then your thinking becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, if I give you step-by-step -step training, then you learn how to attain not moving mind. One by one, step by step. So in this case, good environment, correct average noise level is necessary. And then you can challenge yourself more and more, okay? Inside noise, outside noise, they are sometimes very disturbing. But if you don't make any opinion or you don't have any ideas, then they stop being really disturbing. You can just perceive them as they are. 
Zen has this central concept of suchness or thusness in Sanskrit, tathata. And if you attain that, then wall is just white. Carpet is just gray. When the mind stops making judgment, it becomes stronger. And it can endure. It can endure more than before. It's never the body that breaks. Mind breaks first. Okay. So don't let the mind break. Hit too hard, not trained enough, then broken. Then doesn't believe in itself. Earlier you presented something like selflessness emerging from the transcendence of uh, mind and emotions. Yeah. Uh, why, why can't it be a consequence of reasoning, for example? It could be for and a short time. But what if your reasoning stops? Then what? Doesn't everything stop at some time? <laughs> Yes, it does, but you were not asking about that. We all know that things that start, they also stop. Your question was about this non-dualistic or selfless mind being maintained by reasoning. Is this correct? That's what yes. you asked, if yes. I am not mistaken. Yes. yes. Correct. So reasoning is dualistic thinking. All right? Zeros and ones. How can zero and one maintain something which is not dualistic? For that, you have to take it away. Take away zero and one, and then this clear mind before thinking can appear. And then, if that becomes strong enough, any kind of thinking, any kind of emotion, you don't move. Mind doesn't move. Mind doesn't identify. Mind doesn't make good and bad. So first, attain not moving. And reasoning is always moving. Always. Very smart. Very complex. Very logical. Analytic. Inference. Whatever mind movement you make, you have A to B. Condition, environment, result. So that's okay, but that's not non-dualistic mind. Non-dualistic mind is either before that, before you start to think, or after that, after you stop thinking. And that's why we teach meditation. If it was just attainable by reasoning, everybody goes to university, become Buddha. But unfortunately, if it was that easy, we would be full of completely enlightened professors and academics. And some of them are very, very good people, very clever people, but they're not Buddhas or Bodhisattvas. It takes a different skill. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. How is life without thoughts and emotions? Not human. We are humans. We have thoughts. We have emotions. We need them. And perhaps you need that too. That's why you asked the question. Yeah. And you wanted to catch me. That's also good. <laughs> no, but you said before. Before or after, that's true. Yes, you said before that after we don't have thoughts and emotions, there ah. will be magic. No, I didn't say magic. I was very careful. You said magic. Yes, I said. You did that. That's How, okay. Uh, we never said that you would be totally void of thoughts and emotions, but there is a state of mind just like the soil without any seeds or plants, which is before thinking or before cognition, before emotion. We didn't say you should become attached to that. If you attach to that, you become like a desert. Nobody wants that. It's not human. But somehow, we are also not happy if we have too many thoughts, too many emotions. That also makes us very distressed. So the Buddhas and the patriarchs, especially in Mahayana, they were teaching the middle way. Moment to moment, correct amount of thoughts, correct amount of emotions, etc., etc. So how do you regulate that? You have a bathroom at home, right? Perhaps you also have a bathtub. It's, it's very cozy to have a bathtub. And you open the tap over the bathtub, 
and you see that the water is flowing very quickly. It fills up the bathtub real fast. What do you do? I turn it a little bit off. Okay. Then the water doesn't come anymore. Not off at all. Half. Half. But then, in a few minutes, the bathtub is totally full. Then what do you do? Ah, I stop it. I turn Good. it off. And it doesn't make you distressed that you have no more water in your life, correct? <laughs> Why? Because you can open it at any time. You finish bathing, you clean the tub, and then next is your child. So you fill it up again. So you can have your mind very spontaneous and very clear about how much emotion you need. How many thoughts you need. And you don't regulate thinking with thinking because that's impossible. People tried. But then thinking over thinking over thinking over thinking, very complicated. Also makes you very slow, slows you down. Emotions, if you want to regulate emotion with emotion with emotion, makes you explode or implode. Either way, it's an extreme that nobody really wants, not for a long time. So this intuitive and clear non-dualistic mind spontaneously regulates how many thoughts, how many emotions, without counting, just by perceiving. So don't worry about not having enough. Don't worry about having too much. Find the tap in the bathroom. When you need water, Where? open it. When you don't need water, close it. Okay, so continuing this train of thought, mm -hmm. just the discussion we had before, um, how do you decide in a split second to turn the tap on or off? How did you decide to ask this question? Well, it took me listening to the discussion first, so it took me some time. It wasn't a split second, actually. The decision, that's what I'm asking about. Not the listening and processing. Listening and processing takes time. It's in linear time. But then you heard enough, and then suddenly you make a decision to ask a question. In fact, it happens faster than light. It's very quick. Very quick. And by itself, seemingly. At by least. itself? How does that happen? Now, I'm interested in that because... I don't know. Uh, that's if why it I happens asked. by itself, I like then I don't have to get tired because I don't have to put energy into it. Then thinking happens by itself. I can sit back, relax, and the Excel chart just analyzes itself. So, How does that happen? So we take these decisions at some unconscious level, maybe? We say, don't know. Because if you say subconscious, then where in the subconscious? Yeah. Subconscious is like a big black box. And Zen practice uh, is, I think, one of the most practical practices you can find because it doesn't reprogram your chakras up here. It doesn't tell you what to think, doesn't tell you what to speak, doesn't tell you what to feel. But it puts all the cleansing effect into your subconscious, into your archetypes, into the unknown 95% of your personality so that the 5% would function clearly, correctly. Split second spontaneity. When is that clear? When is it not clear? Depends really on your subconscious. You're right about that. But what does your subconscious depend on? <laughs> you attain this point, you attain conscious and subconscious together. So Zen doesn't open up the threshold in a way that you wouldn't be able to close it back. It just makes it very much transparent. So what you need to remember, you remember right away. What you need to forget, you forget right away. Sometimes people don't think about the second. But imagine that you would just remember, 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 and you wouldn't forget. Your mind would explode in a few hours because it would be overfilled with all that from your storehouse consciousness. So we remember, we forget. We remember, we forget. That's very healthy. So then your operative memory up here remains vacant. It has enough space for anything to appear. We call that mind space. And that gives you a relaxed mind. It doesn't become tight. We always say your mind mirror should always be bigger than your karma. Mirror is bigger. 
it can reflect karma very well. Mirror becomes too tight, karma becomes bigger, shock. First, discomfort, uneasiness, helplessness, frustration, desperation, shock. Okay? Very quickly. So, don't know. But attain that don't know, then becomes yours. Thank you. You're welcome. We heard about Jojo. He was really great Zen master. In fact, without him, we would not have most of our kongans. In Korea, they published a book, recorded sayings of Zen master Jojo, over 300 cases. Disciples were recording it because he was so clear and the teaching value was so high. So it says, newborn baby. A monk as Zen master Jojo, does a newborn baby have the sixth consciousness? That is, conscious thought. Like tossing a ball on swiftly flowing water, Jojo replied. The monk persisted. What is the meaning of tossing a ball on swiftly flowing water? Thoughts, thoughts, non-stop flowing. Jojo replied. Questions. Does a newborn baby have the sixth consciousness? Second, is Jojo's answer correct or not? Third, what does tossing a ball on swiftly flowing water mean? Fourth, thoughts, thoughts, non-stop flowing. What does this mean? Commentary. When the baby cries, the mother gives it milk. Jojo likes the ball, but the ball already killed him. Put it all down. See clearly, hear clearly. The willow is green, the flower is red. In order to understand this kongan, you need to understand a little bit the structure of a human being from a Buddhist, especially Zen perspective. So we have body and we have soul. The body has five important senses. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue and touch, body touch. So this is the first five. The sixth is consciousness, conscious thinking. That's when you say in English that the term Zen stick is attached to this object. We learn this ever since we are born. In fact, when our parents talk to us and we are just six months old, we are already learning it. In fact, it's reactivated in our consciousness, linguistic mind. But this Zen stick doesn't say I'm a Zen stick. We say that. We say that because our sixth consciousness is working. When uh, your memory, the eighth consciousness, is a little bit weak, then you can see, remember, the face, but the name doesn't come. When we get old, it can happen, or when you get a little bit distressed or burdened, then it, this can happen. Sixth is the conceptual mind. The eighth is the long-term memory. The seventh in between is the controller, the duality maker. That's where the stick becomes long or short. That's when this room becomes too hot or too cold. If you put the eight levels of consciousness together, then that's a human being, but there's something more, which is not in the eight levels of consciousness. That's our true nature. Why? Everything through the eight channels is coming and going, appear and disappear. It's all karma. But there's something which doesn't come and doesn't go and perceives everything in the eight levels of consciousness. Now this, which doesn't come and doesn't go and perceives everything like a mirror, that's our true nature. That's what makes us really human. Otherwise, we could be some smart animal. In fact, there are many animals that are smarter than us, like dolphins. I love dolphins. You know why? They do perfect together action. They eat only fish. And they never made a war on this planet. They are much better, in fact, much more intelligent than us. Dolphins never overfish. Human beings, we overfish. We kill all the fish in the seas. There are barely any left. Dolphins never do that. In fact, they understand each other from a very long distance. They have a, a, a brain which is more developed than ours, 
One half is sleeping, the other is active. So in fact, a dolphin never needs to sleep because they can switch on and off the hemispheres as they wish, spontaneously. They're much better than us, but they are not humans. They are animals. They cannot be non-dolphin at all. They can only be dolphin. But a human being is very interesting. We can be superhuman and subhuman, better than human, worse than human, in fact, worse than animal or demon. We can be better than angels or saints. We can become all that because we have this clear mind. We have this true nature. We can change the content of all the eight levels of consciousness, okay? So, when the monk says, does the baby have the sixth consciousness? Joseph says, like tossing a ball on swiftly flowing water. Pak, 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 pak. The monk doesn't understand. He is only thinking. He never attained this child's mind. Mother, they attain child's mind, but they also forget. So this baby had very little connection to reality yet. Mind is not yet forming concepts. Sometimes it, the flicker appears, you can see it in their eyes. Then ball moves a little bit more in the air, then touches the water again, touches the water again, touches the water again. And when the monk persists, then Joju says, now in plain, clear English or Chinese in the original version, thoughts, thoughts, non-stop flowing. But it also goes back to the monk because the monk is only thinking, couldn't stop the mind, couldn't really perceive. Hongas are good in many, many regards. First, because they strike you very unfamiliar. It's really like getting you off the beaten tracks. Your habitual way of thinking doesn't work here. How can somebody ask this question anyway? You know, That's when you doubt. You doubt your old ways. You doubt your habits. You don't have to doubt the Kongan. You just perceive it. You go into it. And when you asked about the Huadu, Huadu is like the diamond eye. This very clear penetrating eye that perceives the depth of the Kongan and doesn't follow the thinking of the Kongan or the emotions of the Kongan. There's a very emotional Kongan, you know, with Nam Chon Zen Master and the cat. Many of you know this Kongan, many of you really don't like this Kongan because it's a terrible Kongan. It's really terrible. Why? Because a nice little cat dies. Even worse that a Zen Master kills the cat. So for those of you who don't know it, in Nam Chon's monastery, the Eastern Hall monks and the Western Hall monks, they argued about this cat. Western Hall says, it's our cat. Eastern Hall says, no, it's our cat. Namchun has enough of that, grabs the cat, takes out his precepts knife, with which usually cuts the first part of the novice's hair, and says, all of you, give me one word and I save this cat. If not, I kill it. Nobody could say anything. Nobody could do anything. Nobody displayed any kind of enlightened mind. Then Namchun killed the cat. If you were there, how would you have saved the cat's life? So this one word, you, you need to understand that. Give me one word and I save this cat. Translation, display or demonstrate your non-dualistic, enlightened, compassionate mind, then I believe you. And if I believe you, I save the cat for you. If not, I kill the cat and it's your problem. That's all. But everybody has reactions. So everybody has very strong reactions to this Kongan, and that shows your karma, emotional karma. Number one bad Zen master broke his precept and killed this innocent little cat. Again, this is not the point. The point is, how do you save the cat's life? This is difficult. So you can put that into your heart. You can remember this, but don't expect to solve this anytime soon. But one morning you can wake up and say, ah, I know. I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay. Then come and have a little meditation. And if during meditation this answer doesn't go away, then bring it to the interview room. Then we check. And remember, this cat is reborn every time that she is killed. Not nine times. This cat doesn't only have nine lives. 
infinite amount of lives. Ever since 1,200 years ago, when Namchan started to kill this cat, it's still alive. It's still moving. It's still in this book. Okay? If you practice, you become clear you can save the cat's life. Don't think that it's impossible. We are not cheating you. The Zen masters don't cheat you. They do not present you with the impossible. It is possible. Like, they asked Mallory, why did you go up to Mount Everest? And he says, because it's up there. This was enough for him as a motivation. So some people are very motivated because the Konga is really up there. It's very high class. It's very, very difficult to solve. But there is a solution. Like, there's a way to go up to Mount Everest. If you get a special helicopter and you climb into the helicopter, and the helicopter takes you up to 8,848 meters. By the way, such helicopter doesn't exist because there's not enough oxygen. Even if you had that special helicopter, you exit to Mount Everest and you die within half an hour. No, not enough oxygen, very low pressure. So your brain and your pulmonary system, your lungs, they would explode. Okay, high altitude pulmonary problem and high altitude cranial problem. Do not want the easy way. The easy way can kill you. So if you really want to climb up to Mount Everest, then go to Nepal and uh, land in Kathmandu and go to the base camp and then camp one, two, three, four, five, six. This is a three month training, sometimes even four months. And you already have to have some experience. Then after three, four months of training, you get the right season. Then there's a one week window every year when it's really safe to climb up and then there's already a traffic jam. You have to start at 2 a.m. And then you can climb up and you can come back, okay? Many people in Buddhism, they want emptiness, they want awakening, they want this and that, and they only have thinking and ideas about it. And if they suddenly get something out of the ordinary, it does more harm to them than good, it disturbs them because they didn't do the training step by step, layer by layer. So when we did in the workshop the mantra which says, take refuge in the three precious ones, the teacher, the teaching, and the student's group, that was not some religious idea. It's a user's manual for going up to the peak and come down alive and healthy. Okay? Okay, so Sunim. Good. Uh, he passed his uh, teachings to the to his um, followers but do we, have, do we have a leader in the zen i want to know if you if you have a patriarch yeah so, we have several patriarchs why do you need a patriarch i don't need i just wondered if i could patriarchs they do their job you do your job how do these two jobs connect if you practice you meet a patriarch you don't practice, you don't meet the patriarch. It says in Zen, when the student is ripe, the teacher appears. Don't worry about leaders. When you really need a teacher, you get it. But for that, you have to make effort first inside. You make effort inside, everything happens correctly outside. You're constantly at disharmony with the outside, something's not clear inside. So make effort. Then the patriarch comes face to face, right in Timishwara in the street and says, Hello, Ignaz, good to see you. Then what? What do you do? Please teach me. Correct. Very good. Soon you meet patriarch. This is correct mind. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Last few questions. The cat problem. The cat problem. I also don't understand the cat problem. <laughs> so that makes two of us. You told us that... Uh, and you said, after a while, I'll wake up in the morning and I'll have the answer. Where does this answer come from? If I should not bother with this question, if I should not be 
obsessed with this Correct. every day. I forget it. You tell me this today and over six months, let's say, I'm optimistic, maybe I should get the answer. Where does this answer come from? Where did the question come from? Yes. <laughs> I know I'm terrible. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you are not magic today. <laughs> but this terrible already helped you. Why? I explain something to you, I steal your mind. I give you food which is going to spoil your stomach. Yeah. Zen doesn't explain. Zen demonstrates. Yeah. That's why I'm terrible. And I will be like that for a long time. To help you. But, uh, yeah. We are used to, with the teachers who tell us one and one is two, and you don't do Actually, like this. somebody in Moscow said some, saw something very interesting, one plus one equals three. But you know what that was about? Vodka, so be careful. <laughs> attain this don't know mind. Then you attain where the question comes from, where the answer comes from, why? Remember the Bible? Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The I is a serious mistranslation. Your true nature is where things begin and end. So your true nature, your true self, is the source of the question and the answer. They do not come from two different places. Attain that, you solve the conga. And not think. For the solution, don't think. But for cooking a nice meal for your family, think. To talk with friends, think. To join, you know, family members and relatives, feelings also necessary. Big relief. No. No? Not at all. Good. Then you're on the path. Okay? So don't attach to form, don't attach to emptiness. This is the final point of this Dharma speech. If you're attached to any of that, then you're in hell. Either in desert, desert means attached to emptiness, or in jungle. Jungle means too many forms, too many thoughts, too many emotions, too much of past, present, future, too much I, my, me. That's jungle. And in jungle, all animals eat each other. But in the desert, you die of thirst. No water. In jungle, there's always water. But you have to find it. So middle way means not jungle, not desert. Enough vegetation, not too much. Enough thinking, enough emotions, enough speech, enough action. It's the hardest because if we were giving you some ideology, you would write it into your forehead and you say, okay, Zen tells me to do this, 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 to think this, 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 to say this, this, this. Zen is terrible because it doesn't tell you any of that. But it helps you attain the middle way and attain the clarity so that you would turn on and off your own tap in your own bathroom in the fashion that it's necessary. So Zen is wonderful because it doesn't give you dogmas. It doesn't give you fixed knowledge, but it helps you attain who you truly are. It helps you attain what this world truly is and more importantly, helps you attain your correct job in this world. So one of the most futile questions, seemingly, is that you ask yourself, why was I born? I live so short. Why was I born? And if you don't get the answer to this question, then in critical times, there's nothing and no one to help you. Now, that's where Zen practice also becomes really essential. Because you attain this original mind where question and answer meet, where Alpha and the Omega come from. The Heart Sutra says, originally things have no beginning and no end. They say the same thing. You attain that, then you can solve your problems. Then you can help others solve their problems. And that's why we practice. And that's why we experience. That's why we don't explain, but use this experience to help all beings. Okay? So I think today you already received enough good teaching, enough explanations, and enough demonstrations also. Thank you very much for being here together tonight. Also, thank you for your efforts and thank you for your teaching also.